right. I think that's it. Good. Welcome. Look at you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm hi, Sue. Uh, is, this is a wonderful moment. We are all together experiencing this life that many of us have uh, shared for many decades. Um, and so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna facilitate, I'm the director. Um, I'm gonna facilitate this discussion that is gonna go something like this. Um, I'm saying hi. Uh, I am going to welcome Frida uh, Berrigan, who is going to say something welcoming. Jim Reale is gonna say something welcoming. Um, I'm gonna come back and say thanks to many people, although not all the people I could possibly thank, which would go on for days. Um, and then we are gonna get to the meat of what we're doing, which is talking to each other about the Berrigans, about plowshares, about our ex what, how they inform us now. So, Frida, where are you? Oh, let me say another thing about Zoom. Uh, Zoom is our, how we communicate these days, right? So try to keep yourself on mute uh, unless you're talking. And if you would like to talk, say something in the chat section. Say, I'd like to say something. I'll call on you. Um, eventually, we will loosen up and we'll all just be talking to each other. But in the beginning, you know, I'm the director, you know, give me a chance to direct and sort of keep things under control and then things will loosen up and we can really get to it. So Frida. Great, hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so I, I wrote up uh, some uh, thoughts thinking that I would... All right, Frida is going to come back. Uh, nope, there she is. Oh, here I am. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, on this day, 18 years ago, Philip Berrigan breathed his last breath. He was surrounded by community and family. Many of you were there with us. Um, all of us had breathed with him cared for him and continued to learn from him through his brief but bruising encounter with cancer. On this day, uh, December 6, 17 years ago, Elizabeth McAllister gathered us all together again for an evening of prayer. And Dan Berrigan gave us the gift, uh, uh, gave us a gift of lyrical insight, a road to navigate our grief and our loss. And it was a poem uh, by Rilke. I think it's a, a poem that is familiar to many of you, and it's short, so I'll read the whole thing. God speaks to each of us as she makes us, then walks with us silently out of the night. These are the words we dimly hear. You say what we call, go to the limits of your longing, embody me. Flare up like a flame and make big shadows I can move in. Let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. Don't let yourself lose me. Nearby is a country they call life. You will know it by its seriousness. Give me your hand. And here we are all these years later with this prodigiously beautiful film. And we're being offered another chance to walk into the very serious country that they call life. And we are not alone. And it could not happen at a better moment. This film seems uh, tailored, it's bespoke even.
bulging this pantsless paroxysm, this hundred minutes to nuclear midnight, this constant war making that we're in right now. Phil and Dan and Liz and the communities that they wove together continue to teach us not to despair, not to despair. They say the praxis is prayer. They say the tools are always the same. Community, prayer, study, reading the times, action, evaluation, more prayer, more action, this, this cycle of, of our work, this cycle of our days. So thank you to Sue Hagedorn, uh, to the Reality Brothers, to Chantal and Maddie and Danielle and everyone else who worked on this film. I'll, I'll finish by saying that one thing I appreciate about this uh, film is that it doesn't put Phil or Liz or Dan in, uh, in amber, right? They're not suspended in a museum for us to marvel at from all sides. They're not relegated to a pedestal uh, to make us feel inadequate or to collect dust. Right, the work continues. The Plowshares movement that they helped to start is alive and well and on probation <laughs> and in jail and awaiting prison uh, as we gather today. The Catholic worker movement that they ran alongside of is meeting the immediate needs of so many during this pandemic and organizing against the systems of oppression and racism and war making that caused those needs. The world is waking up to the nuclear nightmare they work so hard against. And the new treaty to ban nuclear weapons will enter into force on January 22nd, 2021, having been ratified by 50 nations. Um, there's so much work still to do. And this film uh, gives us the nudge, gives me the nudge that we need to keep our shoulder on the plow and our eye on the prize, so. Thank you so much. This was, it was extraordinary to watch it alongside all of you. Jim, thank you, Frida. Thank you, Frida. Sue, is it my turn? Yep. Okay. Well, I was watching the film again for, you know, the, how many times I've watched it. I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if every town in America had a Jonah house or a Catholic worker, we would be such a different nation. So that is my hope for today. Uh, and all the things that uh, that happened to me at Jonah house to completely turn my life around and certainly my siblings can talk about that. But I do recall meeting Phil for the first time. He had his back to me and Carol Berrigan said, Oh, Jim, I want to introduce you to my brother in law, Phil. And Phil turned around. And I looked into his eyes and I knew without either of us saying a word, my life had changed forever. That's the kind of charism and magnetism that, that Phil possessed. And of course, Dan in a very different way. Um, so I hope someday people who aren't already experiencing it, they have a chance to experience community, even on the periphery, going to a Catholic worker, visiting Jonah House and knowing what is it like to live in community? What is it like to live by conscience and feed the poor and say something about the monstrosity that America has become with regards to war making? I hope that happens. I definitely want to say, and it'll come up again and again, but I want to hold up the people uh, that have recently done a plowshares and are awaiting sentencing or already in jail. And that's Carmen, Claire, Mark, of course, Liz here, who has served her time, Patrick, Martha and Steve Kelly. And I want to especially hold up Steve who has done over 10 years in prison. He is just so, so faithful. Uh, and he does jail time like no other person. Most of his jail time has been in solitary confinement. He's really carrying the tor torch for plowshares. So here's to Steve. Uh, and uh, I must say one of the driest senses of humor in the world that Steve Kelly possesses. Uh, but how did, how did we get here? How did we come to be gathered around and on Zoom watching, just having watched this film? And um, 
The Gospel of John starts with in beginning was the word. Well, this film started with in the beginning, there was a phone call. And that phone call was from Sue Haggardorn. Sue owns a house on Block Island. And uh, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And she asked around Block and she goes, I'm thinking of doing a film on Dan Berrigan. And uh, well, everyone said, well, if that's the case, you got to call Jim. So Sue calls me and says, would you be interested in an interview? about uh, on this film about primarily uh, Dan Berrigan and Bill Stringfellow and Block Island. I said, sure, I'd do the interview. It sounds like a great film. So for two years, we worked on that film. And that was... Um, no, that no, was, that wasn't quite how it went, Jim. Before <laughs> I had a feeling you would... You would, you would to, who the hell is she? I got to <laughs> well, do some research. <laughs> I was getting there. <laughs> and so uh, after two years, um, we come up with this film and it's called Seeking Shelter. It's a beautiful little film. It's, it's online now. But right before we finished it, Sue says the four most important words I've heard of the decade. She goes, we have two films. I said, what do you mean we have two films? She said, we have so much footage we need to do another film and it's gonna be a full length documentary. So for the last four years or so, that's what we have been working on with several people, of course, including my two magnificent brothers. We have two films. Uh, and so it is with great pleasure and affection that I introduce Sue Hagerdorn, the inspiration for this film, the director, the executive producer, and need to be said, my dear friend. So. Yeah, crazy person, crazy person to do this. But really my job right now is I could never thank the hundreds of people um, who have made this film happen. I mean, from the beginning with Jim, from the beginning of being on Block Island and filming a, uh, a focus group uh, that was facilitated at the uh, Block Island Historical Society by Ann Tickner to mostly, you know, so I'm not going to be able to thank everyone, obviously, but mostly, mostly, mostly it's the Berrigans. I mean, this film obviously would not exist were it not for, and, and this was, you know, you want to know the number of titles we've had for this film? Don't ask. <laughs> one, of that one of the titles is A Century of Resistance. We're talking about A Century of Berrigan. Um, I like that title. Um, a Century, I mean, starting with the, Ber the Berrigans, your grandparents, Frida and Jerry and Kate, uh, the parents, starting Starting with uh, Dan, starting with Phil, uh, Liz, Frida, Jerry, Kate, Carla, um, and the whole century of Berrigans, and all of the, the pictures that we have, all of the interviews that we have really came through the Berrigans. And why you would have, I mean, it's Jimmy, why you would have trusted me you know, you wouldn't have except were it not for Jimmy and were it not for how you changed me. Mm. Now, I'll just put here, you know, I was on the other side of the movement. I was bombing things. I was blowing things up. You know, my name was uh, Spark, Sparky. You know, I liked fire, you know, so I was not nonviolent and I became changed from your story. Um, and all of those who have been involved in the movement um, and dedicated your lives to uh, resistance to injustice and war. Um, and to Lizzie, I don't know if you're there. Lizzie was my editor for a long time, Lizzie Donahue. Thanks for pushing me, Lizzie. She would not let go of this film. You gotta do it, Sue, you gotta do it. Um, to the Block Islanders who hosted the Berrigans for decades, and cheered this film on. To Hope, my daughter, who always had my back and understands words a whole lot better. She had a whole lot of other titles for this film. To Zane, my grandson, who consistently brought, you know, at 
13, 14, 15, uh, 16 now brought a, uh, a fresh perspective to this movement. Um, to all the folks who answered our requests for interviews, so many of you, why would you trust us? But you did. And you let us into your houses, let us into your offices, let us into your lives. Um, and my genius camera person, Jennifer Cox, um, you let her in too, um, to the anti-war and plowshares movement that continues to show us the way. And finally, to the Reality Brothers, Willie, Jim, Rob, and Rick, come on, you are a Reality Brother. Uh, to Rick Chester, uh, to whom I finally let go. I finally said, take it, make this into a film. And then you all made this into the film that we have today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. How about a toast? Ooh. All right, where's that scotch? Um, <laughs> really to all of you, to the Reality Brothers and to the hundreds of people that I didn't say your name, but know um, how much you're adored. Um, and this film could not happen without you. I'm looking at you. Woo, Jacqueline Lee to Jacqueline, who stayed with this film for years. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you. Cheers. So now we're getting into the the um, into it. Would you speak? Someone asked Elaine and Chad. Say, would you speak to how Liz responded to the film? Um, I can do that. Um, so we watched it. Uh, we saw a, a rough draft uh, together on Block Island this summer um, on Sue's back porch with Carla and Mark. Um, and, uh, and so I think she was primed for it. Um, and, uh, and I think this time, you know, every time, uh, my dad or Dan was on the screen, which obviously was a lot, uh, her whole face lit up. Um, and, uh, particularly with Dan's, uh, zingers and there were so many of them in the film, uh, you know, she really, oh, he's just so good. It's just so good. Um, so I think I think we'll have to watch it a couple more times um, uh, together, uh, and I look forward to that. But um, but I, but I think uh, for her, you know, um, you know, seeing particularly the plowshares and uh, and still being on probation and having her co-defendants, um, uh, 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 Martha Hennessy and and Carmen Trotta, who will uh, go to prison later this month. Um, Steve, who's in uh, jail right now, uh, and uh, the others uh, who, uh, Claire and Patrick, and uh, who will go to prison probably in January, and then Mark, who will be sentenced later this month, uh, to kind of know that all of that is, is uh, you know, carrying on, uh, um, even as, you know, you have uh, Bill and uh, the inner cuts of, of Bill Wiley Kellerman and Steve Kelly and Jim Reale telling the plowshare story um, was, uh, yeah, was particularly sort of a poignant and resonant moment uh, uh, for Liz, um, and knowing uh, how many story, how many of those stories are are out there, and how many of them she knows uh, so well. So, um, uh, so she she really she liked it a lot, and she's watching uh, all of this on the big uh, screen in our living room. Um, so uh, isn't uh, participating directly in the Zoom, but is hearing all of this. And Liz is now living in New London and Kate is in New London and Frida, who was going to become the mayor of New London. I hope that you all, had you been in New London, you would have been voting for her. Um, <laughs> Couple of votes. I'm ready for it. I'll move here so I can win next time. <laughs> Uh, uh, Liz lives uh, about four blocks from uh, Patrick and I and our family uh, with my sister Kate and her partner Karen. Uh, so we're uh, a bubble of eight uh, uh, through this pandemic and uh, spending a lot of time together. So, 
Um, Bill Wiley Kellerman, I know you can hear me. Tell us what you think. Bill was one of our advisors throughout this film. I mean, this went on as Jim noted for, he may say four, I'll call it five years. Um, and Bill was really an advisor to the film. You know, obviously we wanted to keep it as true as we could. So Bill, talk to us. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I was really, really moved by it. Um, the last version uh, I saw it of the film was a year and a half ago, maybe longer, uh, in New York. And I thought it was very good then, but this is not the same film at all. No. Uh, it's completely different and uh, uh, really amazing storytelling, narrative weaving. Um, uh, I was delighted <laughs> to be in the mix with uh, Jimmy and uh, Steve Kelly on the, that, the weaving of the action stuff there. Though, want to acknowledge that our action was not technically a plowshares action. <laughs> and I had said that to, to Sue a year and a half ago. Uh, but still, I think it works. That whole section works beautifully and makes me very happy uh, to, be, uh, to be part of that. Um, I, I think the, the volume of material that's come in since that time, particularly of, of, with Phil and Liz, uh, has just been a really amazing uh, addition to the, to the fullness of the story. And uh, uh, yeah, I think you've, uh, you've done a labor of love, Sue and Jimmy and all, uh, uh, that I think is gonna, gonna bear fruit. Uh, uh, for a whole other generation of um, community and resistance and, and nonviolence. And uh, uh, I'm grateful to have been looped into it a little bit. Thank you. Um, tell us, how about Willie and Rick? When this film came to you, I mean, I am so appreciative for the team that you guys put together that you can talk more about, about uh, how we got to where we are now. And also Amanda and Barry, you were there right at the moment that we don't need to talk about, but at the moment where it was like, oh, Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. Um, Willie, Rick, you got anything to say? Well, I just want to say first off, Sue, um, this became such a passion project for us that um, we saw a cut of it and we saw this huge, huge potential there. And it coincided with the pandemic and it became our lives during the pandemic. But I really want to thank you for trusting us at this time because it's just seeing everybody tonight. It's so consequential what what we're trying to do with this film and how it touches everything. And what Bill said is, it, I mean, I really appreciate that, that that's what we're going for, a particular kind of storytelling that really expresses how deep the commitment was of these people. So I just want to say it was an honor and a privilege to be a part of it. And it was a terrifying responsibility to have the legacy of, of, of Liz and and Dan and Phil uh, and, and, and in our, uh, in, on our desk. Um, and we are, we feel as though the, the story was so beautifully there in as one big solid piece of marble and together with, with Rick and Stu and, and, and a lot of other smart people, we were able to pull enough, the right marble off of it, we think, uh, to make something that is a um, is a statue that will survive, um, and I, it's, it was a, an emotional journey for for me personally. I'm Willie. I'm Jim's brother uh, because I so admire my brother, 
and his commitment um, to humanity. And uh, it was my privilege and honor to uh, help to bring this movie to the fore and, and to uh, and to honor all of y'all who are uh, in, you know, in this great and important movement. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. Woo, seriously. Yep. I mean, if anybody wonders um, what that process was for me, it was, you know, I, I just realized in the last day or so that it really was about, how's that scotch, Willie? Good? It's really good. It's really good. Yeah, I, I called the liquor store last night. Um, the liquor store I'd like came to through. have the the scotch, the special scotch delivered to the two of them. Um, I have my rum. Good um, move. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, what did I want to say? I forget. Oh yeah, for me the process was letting go. You know, I really, really held tight to this. And yet I didn't exactly have all the skills I needed, you know, which is a tough thing, you know, because I mean, I'll just put it right out there. I am a nurse. I mean, I have made a lot of films, but I am a nurse. Um, I may be a filmmaker, but by my heart is as a storyteller, as in a nurse storyteller. So to trust you guys and to trust the process and back off was really, I mean, it was really a spiritual process for me to let go. Um, wow. And of course, right now, you know, in the middle of this pandemic um, and in the middle of this horrible election in the middle of whatever the hell is gonna happen next, um, this letting go um, was a process that, um, you know, I will um, recommend to others. Um, Rob, music, you've done the music all along. Where are you? I'm here, I'm here. He was always late, but now <laughs> he's here on time. Where are you? Um, <laughs> Speaking to your, uh, thank you, Sue. And it's been, yeah, a pleasure for uh, me and, uh, and, you know, thrilling to both do Seeking Shelter earlier and delighted that you asked me to come on board for this. But like Willie, I got to I got to know a lot more about what my brother Jim was doing, you know, in the details in those years. And of course, as we watch those details day in and day out over the last few months, and then know what many other people on this call and meeting were doing in those days, or what their families were doing, or what Jerry and Frida and uh, Kate were doing in those years, you know, that's there's a lot of very moving stuff that goes by so quickly. Um, I know somebody mentioned in some of the chat that they they probably need to go over and see it again once or twice. And having seen it 20, 30 times, I'm here to tell you that that's not a bad thing to do because I picked up little bits and pieces every time in the facial expressions, in the emotion of Dan and Phil and Liz. It was... Uh, Yes, as, as has been said, it was a labor of love. And Sue, to your point about letting go, obviously, you know, we do that. That's, that's our job to do that. But it's not an easy thing for, you know, somebody who's coming to it, who hasn't been doing it for their entire career to be able to do that. So I commend you for that. We, we do that in my department. I'm letting go to Landon, who's not here on my team, and Nancy and Megan and everybody else who's on the music department we have to all trust each other and even more so in a pandemic because you're not with them. You're just letting go of it while they're off in a different part of town doing what they do. And you meet with them the next day or an hour later and hope that everything is gelling the way you want it to. So it was, uh, it was an extraordinary experience. And Samara said, after we finished the mix, she said, well, that was my first remote mix thanks to COVID. And, um, uh, I think, uh, I think we managed, managed the technology okay and got through it, but the trust was a huge factor for, for me. So thank you. Yeah. Um, there are people from Jonah, jo Jonah House who are here and uh, Ben and Casa community. Anything Hi. you guys have to say? 
Um, this is Paul Magno. I'm living at Jonah House, um, and a couple of other housemates are running around doing things, but have been watching this movie tonight, and uh, it's 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 quite something. And um, I'm taken with uh, with um, what's unique about Jonah House's legacy and what that what the uh, you know I, I think of it as a an, an impulse from Catonsville that reverberates down the years. Um, and certainly when I was, when Cadenceville happened, I was an 11 year old in Massachusetts and, uh, never in all my days that I imagined that I would, uh, turn 64 living at Jonah house, um, which I did, um, on Thanksgiving. Um, but, um, to go from, from altar boy to felon, um, <laughs> And having to be a consistency is 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 weird in itself. But I, I just want I just have to say that what this film reminds me, and something that I've really latched onto uh, in the two plus years I've been living here, um, is that um, you know what what came out of uh, what came out of those early draft board raids and out of the early seventies and became Jonah House was a was a not just a couple of heroic guys, Dan and Phil. Um, and I'm glad the film uh, uh, amplified um, Liz's voice and Frida's voice and uh, and Frida's siblings as well, because I think that's the magic of it is there's an interplay among, say, Dan and Phil and Liz, among others, that creates the energy that is what um, this particular form of um, community and resistance and nonviolence uh, has as its strength. Um, um, and that doesn't come out of a heroic guy. That comes out of something much deeper that they forge together and, and refine together along with so many folks um, and have that to hand down. And I don't think Everybody who's an activist these days understands um, those particular dimensions of things. Uh, th that's not what get emphasized in um, contemporary identity politics. Uh, as virtuous as that is in analyzing what's wrong with our society, um, still that depth of um, community and resistance and nonviolence as a as a as a discipline, as a lifestyle, as a way of um, answering um the criminality of our government and the uh pathology of our society is still really important and we have to continue to try and capture that and teach that and this film can do a lot to a dead end so thank you so much thank you does anyone want to respond to that I mean, I think that what you're saying about a way of being. Somebody said, have something to say? Hi, everyone. Uh, Jerry Berrigan here. Um, Jerry. Thank you, Sue. And uh, thank you, uh, Reality Brothers. And it's so good to see so many old friends. Um, and I, right now I'm seeing my cousin Mary Berrigan. That's, that's lovely, too. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to jump on the, the, the Jonah House thing, you know, as, as, as I look out over here, there are so many people who have gone through those doors. And um, uh, we watched uh, the film here in Kalamazoo, Michigan, in our Catholic worker community, nine of us, uh, four adults and five kids, uh, all of whom are getting older and bigger uh, at a rapid pace. Um, and I sat next to our son Jonah, who every time the, the community was mentioned, um, he he lit up because of course that's the community for which he was named. You know that's his namesake. Um, so, and and Molly just asked that we that we kind of bring that out that you know we didn't name him after his grandfather, right? But we named him after this place, uh, which was in, in so many senses you know a, a seed that that burst and. Uh, and, and out of which came the living, you know? And um, 
so it was great to see uh, footage of, of the place. Uh, I found myself thinking a lot of Sister Ardeth Platty, uh, who was another great light um, from Jonah House, uh, who recently passed. Mm. I believe Sister Carol is also on the call. Um, so that's that's just what I'd like to thank you, uh, Paul, for for your words about Jonah House, and I just wanted to jump on the end of that. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And hi, Molly. God, we interviewed you right after Trump was elected. We have a lot, lot of interviews right after Trump was elected. God, what I, I don't know. A lot has happened, hasn't it? Yeah, and I, we had a great conversation, right? Yeah. Um, I, I'm grateful that you left a lot of that out because this isn't Trump's film. Right. Um, it's, it's a film about, uh, about discernment and, and conscious, conscience and joy, right? And, um, and resolve. And uh, it's a film about the people and the people are gathered here. Exactly right. Exactly right. You might have noted, I, I mean, several of you have already said it, that we tried not to make the individuals, a lot of this work was, all of this work was not about getting attention or being the star. I mean, kind of Dan couldn't quite help himself because he was so damn uh, charismatic. But I think if you talk to Dan, he would be like, what, me, who, not me. Um, and definitely Phil and definitely, definitely not Liz. No one did it for, you know, to get a lot of attention. They did it because it was the right thing to do. And because of the community and the prayer um, that went along with that, that community that we're talking about. Um, 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 anyone else want to jo join? How about John Deere? Hi, Sue. Hey, John. Thank you so much for the film. And, and Jim, wow, congratulations. And uh, Rob and Willie and everybody. It's just amazing. And I, I saw Taylor's name there somewhere on the... Yeah. And you, you used Taylor's footage from 30 years ago or whenever. Yeah. I Thank never you, seen Taylor. That Are you here? I, he RSVP'd he was going to be here. This is a whole yeah. story y'all don't want to hear, but uh, um, yeah. Um, I remember uh, when Phil and I got out of prison for our plowshares action, as I recall, this young person who had done an article about me uh, for the Duke magazine said he wanted to do a film about Dan and Phil. He never done it before. And he spent years working on it, and it and it uh, that's Taylor. And then Sue came along, and now Sue, you've used some of that footage. With him, we so worked together. Um, I I want to I I'd love to say a few things. I, I first I'm just very very moved. Um, I do want to ask you what's going to happen next with it, but you know for me. Um, uh, I'd heard so much about some of it, but I'd like, for example, never seen the Dick Cabot footage with Dan. And that was just extraordinary. I'd heard about that, you know, um, and it brought back a lot. And it left me, to be quite honest with you, extremely sad. You know, so I feel very, very sad now after watching that film because I miss them both so much, particularly Dan, well, I mean, I lived in a cell with Phil, but was with Dan for 40 years. And uh, I think, I mean, you, you could make a film series on Dan and still not cover him. That was like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there's so, I, I, I'm just talking about it, how the film opened up oh, so much. I'm gonna say something that, you know, of course, all of you who were interviewed, I mean, we used, you know, like a quarter of a 1% of all the footage uh, that we have. 
And right until the end, I so wanted to keep you in. There was a whole thing you said, what Dan told me when I was a little kid, when I was a kid, you were 18 or 21 or something. What he said to me is, you better have fun doing this. If you don't have fun, you don't be in it. This is about, you know, how you live. And we had a, a lot of fun. I don't know. It was better than that, John. Don't worry. Uh, but in the end, we took it out. Um, no, no, you know, no. As we it took just, most of that things out. It, it just brings back so many memories. I'm sure Frida and Jerry and Kate are quite overwhelmed. Uh, I feel that. Um, uh, and there's... Yeah, I mean, it, it's just for me, it's like a whole other life that I can't quite remember. And um, living in community with Dan uh, as a Jesuit, I know Bill is here somewhere, Bill McNichols and I had an experience of Dan that uh, it's just so very hard to talk about, uh, uh, just the life of the party at all times, but always talking like Daniel Berrigan every single day. He said astonishing things. And I, I, that went on for many, many years. And he would say things to me that I just couldn't believe he was saying, you know, like, what, what are you talking about? And uh, they were so far above my head. But seeing your film, Sue, is like, it's discovering archival footage of the Acts of the Apostles. Forgive me for putting them on a pedestal, Frida, but... Uh, <laughs> it's fabulous. And it brings back uh, these... Um, mythic figures who Dan kept talking about staying small and not placing your hope in results. But uh, you brought him back alive to me and, um, and it gives me hope and courage to go on in a very bad time. And, uh, and everything is so different. And it was all very small, our life. And it was all so mythic at the same time. And I get some of that in the film and I, I like that. But just to hear Dan speak is quite astonishing. Um, Joe and Earl and I are working as Dan's um, literary trust, and I'm his executor, and we're working away on a lot of other little projects. Dan's 100th birthday is May 9th, and we had talked years ago about having a big spectacular event in New York City but I, I don't know, Frida and I have been, hadn't been in touch, but I've just decided we can't do it because of the pandemic, you know, and, but we can do online things. And my, I'm just sharing here a little bit. I, my dream is still to get a, a really good website of Dan's writings and poetry and all, but I have no money and I've been asking everybody. So if anybody wants to help me with that, write me. But Sue, I'm just really, really grateful. And the famous Reali brothers and all the other filmmakers. So. You've given me a great gift, and I'm sure everybody. So where is it going? Is it going to be on PBS or HBO or, or a movie? Well, now, now we're looking for a distributor. We had uh -huh. to get through this. Um, we had to finish, finish, finish. I think we're finished, finished, finished. And now the real, no, I mean, nothing personal, Reality Brothers. But now, in a sense, we, this whole, whole community, all 73 of us who are still here and hundreds others are that community and we'll be looking for, I mean, I hope it's on PBS. You know, we're really going to have to make that connection. And the idea of the film is not as a, an object that is then, you know, placed out there and disappears. We know you know, what happens to films, they can, they just disappear. But the idea is one, to get it into lots of people's consciousness. Yeah. And secondly, to facilitate discussions about this. Um, you know, this should go on for years, I hope, of talking about, which is what we can do now too, the relevance of this now. Why now? Um, what are, what are these guys and, and, and Liz and this family and this century of Berrigan um, have to do with us now? And, and who are we to Zane, my 16 year old grandson? 
I mean, you know, I, I don't know where he is, but I can tell you Zane, oh my God. I mean, you know, if you, uh, who was it who said he saw the film robbed, you know, a hundred times or 25 times, I think that Zane probably saw the film a hundred times uh, because it was in the dining room and it was in the living room and it was, you know, Hope and I constantly talking about it on and on. And he was an adolescent and was changed by this film and started talking about a movement of young people that could be, an, you know, was inspired by the Berrigans. And I'm hoping that there are is a movement of young people and of old people and everybody in between that says, yeah, now, this is relevant now. We don't have to be so silent and so silenced with our masks. Um, we can do, we have to do something. And, and it, you know, to have uh, Joe Biden, you know, like he is a nice guy. Um, you know, he is a, a moral guy, uh, but it, this, this is not the end. Um, we are needed more than ever. I, I love that, Sue. Uh, this is Frida, and I, um, I just wonder if uh, folks uh, gathered, uh, Ben and Casa, want to say anything about that, or Jasmine and Eric uh, Stoner. Well, actually, I see Eric walking away or Eric Martin, their work with young people, or um, uh, just uh, some of the ways. Nothing like, uh, nothing like Jonah House in the early 70s, uh, but, but are certainly on the, on the same, on the same, you know, spider, Yeah, take you good. Take yourself uh, off mute. Hello, Great. everybody. Hi, so I'm Karen, and I'm here with uh, Jimmy and Lou, who a lot of you know from the Peace Poets, uh, Witness Against Torture, and Colleen and Dylan, and our dog is around somewhere, and Baby and Sean just went to bed. But a couple quick things. So, of course, with COVID, we're not uh, doing the hospitality that we were doing, but every time a group would come, a student group, a group of women religious or men religious coming to the United Nations, uh, Kosecha, uh, so folks, undocumented folks pushing immigration, farm workers from the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, part of our orientation to hundreds of people a year coming to visit the Dan Berrigan Center at Ben and Casa and to study there and to work there and to use it as their home base, was the story in, of, and is this continuing legacy of what it means to resist as a faith-based community. Um, so not even kidding, several times a week, I ask myself, what would these people do in this situation? And just on a personal level, I went to Jonah House when I was in college. Of course, it changed my life, like everybody is saying. Um, and then had the privilege of coming to New York and being a part of Dan's Thompson Street gathering, the Jesuit gathering. So, and Ben and Casa really grew out of the liturgies in those two communities and resistance. Um, so I guess one of the very like relevant things that happened in the last months is we asked ourselves what we were supposed to be doing during the pandemic as people of faith. Um, and while Dan's resistance has been, of course, a, a key pillar in why we named the Dan Berrigan Center after him, it was his work with AIDS patients um, that also really spoke to us, especially because our friend Maureen McCafferty uh, introduced us uh, to Dan's real lovingness. And our friends Allison and Mark sort of spoke about Dan's relationality to folks, uh, his personalism which is of course the Catholic worker word. So we asked ourselves, how are we supposed to be uh, courageous Christian, Christians in the pandemic? Like, what are we called to do? And because we had lived with Liz uh, 
for, for quite some time because we'd been to Jonah House, because we've been a part of the Thompson Street Jesuit gathering, because we knew Dan's life, we knew a few things. We knew not to panic, right? We, are, we knew to stay steady in our prayer. And from that discernment about how we were supposed to care for the people in our house and for others, our community ended up going and, and really working with Colleen's community at Little Sisters of the Assumption and keeping open their food pantry. So it was closed um, and our community split. Half of us took a Catholic worker shift making 250 bologna sandwiches. And then the other half of the community went to Little Sisters and not even kidding, served 700 people a day. Um, but of course it's this legacy of what it means to be a radical Christian to Catherine of Siena, to Dorothy Day, to the Berrigans. What do our teachers tell us about how to act in this moment. Um, and I think staying calm, not reacting to the headlines, reacting to the scripture, and from that place of groundedness, thinking about what's good for the most vulnerable. And of course, wanting to be a model to other people, but not doing it for other people's gaze, doing what, what we thought on the other side of this pandemic, we wanted to be proud of. Um, and yeah, I just really grateful for that witness who, who has the teachers that we have. And I think what we try to do with the Dan Berrigan center is keep telling these stories that are relevant and modern, um, and show the Tom Lewis pictures made in prison and uh, show the advent calendar that Liz made in prison and, and show these works of art, art and beauty and joy uh, as this model for how we resist. Uh, and the times change. If you talk to us in six months, there'll be a new thing, hopefully, um, for us to say, this is how we use the story of the Berrigans in our lives. Mm -hmm. But we are, we're so blessed to have teachers. And I, I think that's, the relevant, uh, the relevancy of the Berrigans is these are our teachers, right? Um, and in the same way that your teachers at school were your friends' parents, like I see Frida uh, and Jerry and uh, yeah, and Kate and Karen and, and Molly and Patrick and I'm like, those are my friends and their parents are amazing. Um, and I'm so happy to be in the work with them. Uh, but and if, if we could take up two more minutes of your time, I just, mm. Lou, you're not limited to two minutes, but our other dear friend who's been in the movement with these folks for a long time is here and I want to bring him forward. Hi, loved ones. Uh, greetings. It's so good to see you all and feel your spirits gathered in our circle here. And I, um, I just want to take the, a minute to let this be uh, the film as a piece of art nourished us uh, in a good way tonight. And I feel, I feel that. And also each one of y'all just getting to see your faces and hear each other's voices as nourishment. What was so powerful to me in the film was just hearing Dan's uh, voice. And it made me remember that I, I need to hear that voice all over. Um, and I need to hear it, and I do hear it. It helped me hear it in Karen's voice as she spoke right now, and in Sean's voice, and Jimmy's voice, and the voice of my loved ones, uh, is to let my friends be prophets, is to not believe in idols and not, but not need heroes, but to see the heroes in, in those who are next to us every time we have the courage to act in love. And so that's a reminder that we get, uh, that I feel like I always got from Dan uh, to, to see that and call, call that forward. Uh, and I could also hear his voice saying, just read the poem. Uh, and so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sing you a small poem uh, just as an act of uh, hugging you uh, with my voice because I can't hug you with my arms tonight. Um, this is, I feel like, what's coming through. We are hurting, but in this pain we're learning how to love our people 
from now on. And we are growing, and finally we are flowing, wild like a river from now on. I'm going to say that one more time. We are hurting, but in this pain we're learning how to love our people from now on. We are growing. We are growing, and finally we are flowing, wild like a river from now on. Wow. Sue, so can I add a personal just a personal note here. Oh yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say that just it was an emotional roller coaster. I've seen as um, you know a few of the rough cuts, but that just it really blew me away, and it was emotional. But what the biggest thing was that of that was um, some of you, many of you know that my mother has Alzheimer's, and she is pretty narrow in her world vision right now. Um, but her caretaker kept texting me pictures of her and giving me blow by blow updates. And my mother kept getting closer and closer to the screen. She was touching it. She was remembering people. She was saying, oh, that's my Jerry. Oh, Phil looks old um, and got very excited about Dorothy Day and went on about how Dorothy Day was her dear friend. And she just, there was just picture after picture of the delight on her face. So thank you. Oh, Carla. Uh, Carla, my girlfriend. Um, Carla is the daughter, one of four children of Jerry, the next brother. Now, you know, uh, of course, this film has had, you know, like a hundred different variations. One of them included Jerry, who was, who could have been Jerry Berrigan, the next brother up, could have been, was also one of the Berrigan brothers. Um, and there are some beautiful pictures um, of, of your dad, Carla, in the film. And as those who've been working with us recently, have known, I'm like, no, put more in, put more in. What about that picture of Jerry and Carol? Put it in, put it in. Um, because they were brothers. There were six boys. And Jerry was, also was in the priesthood, uh, your dad. And Carol, oh my God, her smile, her smile. Um, anyway, you know, I, I'll say something about my connection with you all has been, I mean, it is, it has made my life so rich. You know, you might say, um, you know, why be a, a documentary filmmaker? Um, and if it isn't because of the relationships that you make while making the, while your heart is moved by everything and you're working your butt off. I mean, trust me, don't anybody think it's a romantic thing. It is, totally a pain in the butt. It would be so much easier to, you know, do a whole lot of things, but you get so, I have become so connected to all of you, all how many of her, many people are still online here and so many others of, you have given me so much and I have the, the connection and the inspiration um, of people I've known and worked with and haven't known um, has been glorious. So thank you. Um, anybody else? Hi. Hey. I'm Kathy Boylan. Oh, Kathy. Um, the Kathy. Dorothy Day I Catholic Kathy Worker Kathy. in Washington. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the, Sue and Jim and everyone else who was involved. 
Um, and uh, while I was watching the film, so, some things happened like, uh, I, I was born in 1943 in the Bronx and I went to St. Barnabas Church and I was confirmed when I was maybe nine by Cardinal Spellman. So thank God, <laughs> you know, he was the one, you know, go off to war. Uh, so I thought that was uh, just, it just shows what a miracle it is that I'm, I'm part of this, you know. Uh, how did God take this kid from the Bronx? And I end up uh, at the Catholic Worker and meeting all of you wonderful people. And um, and I, I thought uh, of, of when you were speaking, Stu, about the miracle of being told, you know, like doing this film, I thought of Eric Martin, because he said the same thing about, uh, you know, he was asked by Dan uh, to do uh, the, write the, uh, edit the book, or the, not edit the letters between Dan and Phil. And so if you haven't gotten to read uh, that book, please do so. Um, and Eric is right here on the on the camera. But one of the lines that meant a lot to me um, was that um, it, it's whatever we we believe in, it's going to cost us something. And if it doesn't cost us anything, maybe it's not really, you know, important. And uh, I woke up on Saturday morning uh, with uh, W, what is it, the National Public Radio, uh, defining someone like me, an anti-vaxxer, as a member of, uh, as a ISIS. I'm a, a member of ISIS. And I, when, I, when Dan said, in the film that he was charged with terrorism. I, I, I take consolation, you know, uh, knowing that my friends have been called, you know, like ridiculous terms, like, uh, you know, we're, we're terrorists or whatever. We're not terrorists. We love life. We care about life. And the uh, yeah, I'm worried. I'm I, in the pandemic. Uh, just to show how I go on, I I trust the information and I share it with you and encourage you all to look at it. Children's Health Defense and the High Wire. I took a sign. Uh, I have not followed the lockdown. I've invited people into the house. Uh, I refuse to be afraid. And um, I, I want to uh, invite everybody not to be afraid, uh, to serve our brothers and sisters always. And um, that's it, you know, and I learned it from uh, the people of the film and all of you who are gathered here. And I'm at the Catholic Worker, so if you all want to talk about this or disagree with me, I, call up and talk to me. I'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. I meant to interview Kathy. How many times was she on our list, Jim? Yeah, she was, yeah. Got, I, uh, I was in a plowshares with Kathy and she's just marvelous, mother of five. And uh, went on the stairs of, uh, a nuclear power plant where her husband was one of the big executives and just denounced terrorism and that was um, uh, I believe that was the end of the marriage and the beginning of or one of the beginnings of Kathy's resistance. So. Could someone explain this to me? Is there a can no can anyone hear me? Yeah we hear you. Yes. Yeah. We got it but we don't see you. Hello everybody. 
Hey, Kathy, is there someone else? I see that, um, 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 let me see, someone asked, I think, wow, it was way back when, about the animation, about the dreamlike qualities um, of the poetry. What did you guys think about that, about the poetry? And at one point there was a lot more animation. We had the most glorious animator, uh, Dustin, who did these amazing, amazing dreamlike uh, pictures that we ended up using way less than what we really had. Um, but he illustrated these poetry and, um, you know, uh, speeches by Dan and readings that are writings that Dan had. Um, and then we were really lucky to have Bill Pullman um, be able to be the, uh, using the letters that Eric uh, Martin published in the book of letters between Dan and Bill and letters that were, that are up at Cornell in the um, archives we were able to pull Bill in to really um, be uh, the voice of uh, Phil Berrigan. So what did you guys think of that? Did it work? Did we need more of the art, less of the art? Did it take you out of the film? Did it put it in, put you more into the dream like, um, what do you think? Uh, I thought it worked well. I enjoyed it. This is Alza. And uh, the whole film was really uh, extremely moving and makes me want to uh, get back into the action again. Uh, yeah. Spend the end of my life uh, doing this, which I learned early in life from Phil and Dan and, and being in some of the early uh, actions that uh, were going on. And I was wondering, is there any possibility of getting uh, copies of this at some point? Because I have lots of people I want to get uh, involved with them. We will deal with that. Right now, uh, we want to get it out, out as widely as we can. Um, and this is a one time, we love you guys, um, event. And then we hope that you will help us also advocate for this film um, to bring it out. This is an important, if we're having this experience, there must be, millions of others who don't know who the Berrigans are or were, don't know about this meet, this movement and will think, wow, this could, this could work for us now. I'm seeing a uh, Willie, you're having a response here. You wanna say something? Yeah, I, yes, I do. I, um, I, we are very anxious to, to employ all of you in getting this film out to as many people as, as we can. And we are going to coordinate with people that know how to do these kinds of things on and in other ways. Um, and so uh, be prepared to hear from us and uh, for you to help us uh, you spread the word uh, because we have uh, an important tool here. Um, and so we're, you're, you're, you are now in the army. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> One other thing is that you are the first audience to see this film. So your responses are important to us uh, in terms of how it plays and how the, how, how the story holds together. So it's been very gratifying for us to hear, hear the responses. Yeah, we're encouraged and, um, and we're gonna bring it out there with, uh, with all the horses we can, we can muster. You know, and let me say something more about uh, Rick and Willie that they took- Oh, one. no, 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 no. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, get out that scotch. I sent you that scotch for a reason. Um, they have been brilliant in their storytelling. Yeah, we have the story. I mean, you know, I thought 
five times, four times, three times, we had a story that could have been taken out uh, to the public and would have been really good. But what these guys did was one, treat me gently, thank you, um, and uh, treat me respectfully, really important in doing this work. I feel like crying right now, because uh, that really, the other part of being a documentary filmmaker is it's the respect that happens uh, between um, colleagues. It's a, it's a group activity. Uh, a team activity and that you guys got it in terms of do, doing storytelling. It was a very, it was a brilliant process that you guys used and thank you. Yay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks for saying that too. <laughs> <laughs> but by, by the way, you know, it was, there was a really very, very, um, uh, productive back and forth between uh, us and you. And, and we would, you know, we had really uh, what we felt were strong ideas. And when you criticized them, we took your criticism to heart. And it was a, a very magical uh, experience for all of us. And I think uh, that we um, arrived at something that was uh, streamlined and that can really reach a wide audience. And that's what we're desperate to do. Yeah, we're desperate to do it, guys. Yeah. But let me also say something, which uh, probably we should stay with our desperate to get our film out. Uh, but I'll just say, you know, I'm a feminist and I really, it was, I, my expectation was I was going to be working with women throughout this film. And the idea that we were, that, that this film was about men. I mean, for the most part, thank God we were able to integrate Liz into this. Um, and that I was working a lot. I mean, I was, I really appreciated your respect and our way of working together because it was, it did not come naturally to me. Um, I kept thinking, you know, but Lizzie, I think that you're there. Lizzie, aren't you there? My first, not first. Yes, I am. Sorry. Say something to us, Lizzie. Can we see you? Uh, hold on. You can do it. I can. Hi. Hey. Wherever you are. We were watching it in the dark, so I didn't turn it on. But anyway. All right. Lizzie, Lizzie, I, you know, I thanked right up front that had she not been so persistent or a pain in the butt, this film would not have even started. Um, come on, come on, you got to do it. So go ahead. I agree with, I can't remember who said it, but I think there should be many films about this moment and um because christianity is considered the religion of the united states and there's a lot of people who call themselves christians and i personally i was raised catholic and i i had spirit i was born with spirit and i it was maintained despite the Catholicism. And when I started to, I think it was when you did the Block Island conversation. Yeah. That's when I was introduced to Berrigan and I started reading him voraciously. And also, this is gonna be a thorn in your side because I always used to bring it up, William Stringfellow, <laughs> who I believe is crucial to the development of Berrigan's spirit beyond the form of Catholicism. I think Berrigan transcended the structure that is the Catholic Church, which we know is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is the McDonald's of religion. You know, they were the first franchise for the spirit. And I really appreciated what you stirred up in the film that is about spirit. And I love Frida. I love, 
when we were watching it, I knew the part about your your dad and your uncles laughing was coming up. And like, there was just some great, really human moments about these were not, they were not um, prophets. They are men. And they were men who in a funny way, this is gonna sound really perverse, they used their white skin male privilege to put themselves at the forefront against the power. And they really didn't take that for granted. They knew what they were doing. And when they were in prison, I know from reading Dan's and, and, the, and the letters, they understood they had privilege even within the prison system because of their white skin. And I just feel like there's so much more that could be done. And I hope John Deere, I hope you do a GoFundMe or whatever the kids are doing these days to get your website up because I know uh, Sue is extremely generous with her, with her resources in terms of like when she makes a film, she likes it to be out there. And there's so much footage and archival. And so I, um, I'm very moved. So I, I feel very passionate about what you did. And it still is a, is a real uh, warm. I mean, I miss not seeing uh, Thick Not Khan in it. I wish you had been able to get him. And even bell hooks, but that's a whole other, you know, story that I know. I know. See, I can't stop. So you can't. <laughs> I'll I'll leave it at that. And congratulations, everybody who worked on it. Thank you. Can, can I pipe? Can I pipe in here? Thank yeah. you for that. I'm so glad that you captured that because as I'm hearing you say, you want this um, talking about getting the film out, and all I can think of is mom who uh, was dear friends with all of these guys, um, who would have me showing films, documentary films on our commons, our, our like walking mall, outside mall in Ithaca, uh, when all my punk friends were walking by and having fun. And I was like having to show films on, you know, the roses in December and the four church women being killed in El Salvador or nuclear you know, weapons or, or the Hiroshima Nagasaki films. So, and sent into to, to school with the, the documentary on Attica uprising and um, having to bring that in and made to do these things. It was not like a choice. <laughs> it was kind of like, this is what we do. <laughs> and, um, I have to say, because we've just passed that anniversary of the, um, the four church women being murdered in El Salvador, um, and I just, it was, I think it was um, Jackie's, uh, Chris Allen Dusso posted the film. And so I watched it again for the first time since I was 16 or 17 when I last was showing this after every mass. My mother made me in Annabelle Taylor Hall in the Catholic community, like the church where Dan used to say mass and um, how that formed my, instructed my teenage uh, development in faith. And one of the pieces that this film that really strikes me is that it, it, it has, the potential to show what is faith and how does faith instruct what you do. And, and it brings you to places that aren't always pretty. And it brings you to places that make you feel like you're, uh, what's the word you used, Rita? It was really great. Uh, like you're kind of working hard at not being comfortable. But in fact, I feel like it was just that was the way in which that generation of people actually lived. Like they, they saved every last plastic bag and like they just did this in a natural way. Um, and also as a way of debunking the, the culture as well. Uh, but I think for me, one of the main pieces and I've you know, given talks on it, which is faith development is in seeing how people live their lives of faith in the face of, of uh, great adversity and yet joyfully at the same time. And I think that's the piece that is brought through in the film as well. So thank you so much, Sue, and guys, reality guys, and everyone who put this together. Thank you. 
Sue, I just would love to hear from Eric Martin. Several people have mentioned his name, yeah. his editing of the Berrigan Letters, and that book here uh, has been so instrumental in the film. Uh, and I'd love to hear from Eric, as well as his uh, PhD, The Theology of Disobedience. And this has been marvelous. It's He got his PhD. Uh, on uh, the, converse, the conversion, conversion of Daniel Berrigan. It stands early years, 1953 to 66. I read it, it's magnificent. I learned so much about Dan that I never knew. I wonder, Eric, if you could say a few words. Wow. Sure, yeah. Um, I guess first, just that was an amazing movie. Thank you for making it, it's deeply inspiring. And uh, to echo, I can't remember who said it, but... Um, doing the Berrigan letters since he just held up. Uh, after about 10 minutes of doing the work on that and getting in the archives, I turned, I should mention it's co-edited. I did it with my friend, Dan Kasaki. Um, I said, we have to include Liz. This can't be on the Berrigan brothers. This has to be a three person book. Um, but I learned very quickly, I don't carry any um, institutional weight. No. <laughs> Some unpublished grad, grad student doesn't get to make a lot of decisions. Uh, so once the contract was signed, it was pretty much unchangeable. But also after maybe a week in the archives, we said, this also has to be about, about Carol and Jerry. This, this has to be about five people. This can't be about three, you know, two brothers. Uh, and really, I mean, the, the story should really be about everyone here. I could imagine doing a book, you know, on Elaine and Ched's community or Ben and Casa, but I don't know. I guess I'm just, I feel very lucky to be amongst this whole community and welcome them. Um, yeah, I don't know. No one's ever held up my dissertation and said anything uh, about it before. I got to say, Jim, that was, <laughs> well, I don't know what, what should be said. Yeah, I, I, I went into the letters, not between Dan and Phil, but for my dissertation, uh, on just on Dan's life. Well, how, how did he get to be, uh, be Dan Berrigan? Because he started out as this Rome-loving patriot who was marching around after, after V-Day um, with an American flag and celebrating. And so I just thought, well, he was really pro-America and loved Rome, what happens? So I went back into his old letters just with everybody to kind of trace what was his theological conversion? How did he get from one theology to another? And something I found, uh, I was really struck with was the legacy of the worker priests in France in 1954. Yeah. Uh, he goes as they're being shut down by Rome, essentially, this creative experiment of priests who offered an alternative way of being priests, of going to work with Marxists in the factories, labor with them, live with them, not act as a priest, but act as one of them. And that is their witness, their incarnation. And he was deeply formed by that. And when I think about Liz and I think about the Berrigan brothers and I think about the wider community, there is a deep um, enfleshment of that in the whole charism of this this. Christian left world that I'm looking at right now. I don't know. I, I don't really have anything divine to say. I don't, I don't really want to take up a lot of time. I, that's just something I, this, this whole idea of incarnation and Claire Grady said it. I don't remember if it was during the sentencing or during the trial for the King's Bay plot shares, but just the idea that you can enflesh the prophets and Lizzie, I don't know you. I've never met you. I really appreciated what you had to say. Um, so maybe I should say, I don't know. <laughs> I really appreciated when you were talking about the prophets, right? That they weren't prophets, they were men. But the prophets were also men. And because the biblical was created in a patriarchal time, but, you know, prophets can be anybody, not just men, but they're sort of remembered as men. But uh, I don't know. I, I'm just deeply struck with how human all this is. And I've heard in these comments this sort of, well, we hold them up as heroes and saints and prophets. But also, we need to remember it's, it's not just about these gargantuan individuals that we celebrate after they die. As Liz said, at the funeral, right? Uh, Dan's funeral, right? A double dose of Dan's spirit would be nice rather than just let's all celebrate Dan. Um, I don't know. I just think there's something deeply human that you captured in this movie that I'm really grateful for. And I don't really want to take up anyone else's time, but it's lovely to see you all and thank you. So appreciate hey, that. Hey, Eric. Thank you to, uh, from Rick and me. Oh, sorry, Jimmy. No, go, go ahead, Willie. Okay, Jim. Um, Eric, thanks from Rick and me. Those letters were really, really helpful in for us to understand the uh, the, uh, the journey of, of the brothers. Um, and we would like to actually um, uh, go back to something that 
uh, Sue said about, you know, yeah, we're, we are a couple of uh, white dudes, um, but there are a lot of uh, super talented and uh, women that have worked on this film. And Samara, are you there? Samara? Samara? You, you still with us? I'm, I'm still here. Hi. Samara, can you just like outline that, uh, just uh, sort of call out all of the uh, all of the great yeah. women that have worked on this film? That uh, Samara is a co-producer on the film. She was uh, she, she helped us uh, with great skill get it to, get us to the finish line. So go ahead, Sam. Well, um, yeah, it's yeah. just like it's just there are so many great women who made this who made the movie and so and you are uh, you are at the top of the list so if there's I mean after Sue so if there's if there are people that you want to mention in terms of the editors and post-production and everything I, I would love to mention all of the wonderful women that have worked on this film yes thank you um, uh, starting with Chanel who worked closely with me my coordinator but also uh, Maddie Ackers our archival producer who was on the show before I was on who like every piece of footage that you've seen that was not shot by Jennifer um, was something that Maddie helped get licensed. Uh, Jacqueline, an editor on the film, Kristen Nutil, an editor on the film, um, Nancy Allen and Kira Bellin, our music editors, Megan uh, Courier, our music supervisor, um, Samantha Uber, our conform artist who did tremendous work on the project, Marcy, our colorist, I mean, we've, We've been very lucky just with the amount of talent that we've had in the film, uh, regardless of gender. But yeah, we've had some pretty amazing women on this film. And I'm sure I've forgotten people and I apologize for that. Right, thank you. Thanks, thank Sam. Thank you. Hi. It is can, I, can I make mention of something? Yeah. Uh, I'm Marianne Grady. I'm uh, very close with the Berrigans. My sister, Teresa, just spoke before I, and I wanted to, the, the film was so moving. And because we grew up with Phil and Dan in our living room from when I was, I remember learning how to set a table when I was four in order to get the dinner table ready for when Phil came over. And that was um, when he'd come out of the South and had written No More Strangers. Um, so I really appreciate the piece in the film about uh, Phil and Dan's understanding, especially Dan, Phil, um, understanding the issue of race and racism. And the quotes that you put in there were so profound and so apropos for this moment in our history. So I think that that's gonna really help uh, move the film into audiences that will get it. It's uh, really important. So thank you. Um, having grown up in the Bronx um, and grown up in communities like uh, Jerry and Frida and Kate, um, we, we have to be about that uh, solidarity with the poor. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We really felt strongly about the race piece. Um, it it uh, was so important who Phil was um, and his being um, a Josephite and Jerry, uh, Eric, you said that really was the three brothers. It really it was the three brothers and Liz. Um, you know, and two Josephites uh, who were dedicated to uh, deal it, you know, about dealing with our horrible uh, uh, legacy of race in this country. Um, it's really important. I'm glad that we could do that. Also, let me just say, Eric, your letters, whoo, or they weren't your letters, but the letters that you published, it really gave us a sense of um the father and how the conflict between the two brothers around their father where you know dan was very forgiving and phil that was not phil's style um you know he was he he was he was angry um about his father and you know we could have gone more deeply into the difference and we, we 
held back on that, but you really informed us a lot. Those letters informed us a lot of um, what a an amazing man Phil that uh, Dan was in his forgiveness at the end of his father. I mean, thank you for publishing those letters. Yeah, oh, thanks. Nothing could feel less useful than being in grad school, so I'm glad it could be of some use to somebody. Stop <laughs> with that. Funny. Everybody's got to go to grad school, and then they become then then they are who you are. Stop. So, so Eric, again, just a little personal note. So my entire life, um, you know, Dan, Phil, and my father wrote to each other weekly, and as you know, because you've read most of the letters, because my father, you know, sent them all to DePaul and all of that, but there was always the ceremony that the weekly letter would the weekly letters would arrive in the mailbox and my father would take the letters out and he would go into his study and he would read them and then we wouldn't see an appearance from my father for quite a long time because then he was then writing the letters back so your book was it was really really beautiful because i feel like you know i lived on kind of the periphery of seeing their relationship together through those letters. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, not my book, it's their book, but I'm, yes. I'm grateful nonetheless, yeah. And I will say just one last thing, since we're talking about racism and anti-racism, I'm, I'm also glad you included that, Sue, in Stokely Carmichael, you had Scahill. Yes. Quoting Stokely Carmichael, that Phil Berrigan's the only white man who knows where it's at. But in Charlottesville, so I lived in Charlottesville, was active with our own community, which was kind of a sister, like cousin community to the Catholic worker called Karis. And we were kind of at the center of the clergy resistance to the anti, uh, to the, you know, the KKK and neo-Nazis and white supremacists there. And the story is finally being told by the creator of Karis Community. Her name is Grace Aaron. Um, she's starting to write the, the story of the community. And the way, one of the ways uh, she, she chose to express it is between using these letters between uh, Dan and Phil. And she talks about, we were, we were really found ourselves in a situation that the Berrigans found themselves in and the 60s and it was expressed by Dan in a letter saying we're really just kind of bumbling around in mud puddles figuring things out on the fly <laughs> we have mm -hmm. lights we have prayer and we have each other and we have community but uh we don't know what the hell we're doing <laughs> so it, it was also drawn upon by anti-racists and whatever like it's all you know it's always problematic to invoke white white racial heroes and that's not what I'm trying to do but it is good to remember that Sometimes people talk about, well, white culture is just uh, not a resource for anti-racist work. It's good to remember that in limited ways and imperfect ways, the Catholic worker, the Catholic left, the Berrigans and Liz, like these are real valuable, necessary resources for white people to build on today uh, during the Black Lives Matter era, I think. Yes. If I may tag on to that and just say, I am very grateful to Claire, my sister and Liz and, and the seven, the Kings Bay Plowshares seven, and how um, central the, uh, their message was of uh, the triplets in, well, I wanna say the, the four pillars of evil that the Poor People's Campaign name, which incorporates the triplets that Martin Luther King talked about. But I appreciate that, you know, where we came from and what is being dealt with is being put forward in their mess in the messaging of the Kings Bay Plowshares, and that the racism element or the white supremacy is so uh, necessary for us to be keeping for you know in the in the in the forefront. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron. I just want to give one more uh, highlight, Eric. I really want other people to read your dissertation. I really feel, so far as the early error of Daniel Berrigan, you are the expert. Uh, and so um, I'd love for you to find some money to publish your thesis, uh, maybe in a shortened version, because it's, it's a tomb um, and much, in a little more readable, less academic, but I hope that can happen. Uh, and um, it's, it's so important. It's really, it's, it's really a magnificent piece. And I just want to encourage you to move that forward uh, mm -hmm. and find the monies yeah. wherever you can. I think that Sue may have access to a foundation. So maybe that's one possibility, but um, it's, a very, it's very important. The early years of Dan are crucial that I knew nothing about. And I must've had a hundred dinners with Dan on Block Island, just me and Dan. 
and I never knew this stuff. So uh, I just want to encourage you to, to bring that forward as best you can. So well, I want to say something, uh, Eric. For a while, probably the most important thing in the film, which you don't see now, is about the worker priests. The work, that period of time after the Second World War and Dan's association with France, um, that he really became part, he really almost became French, uh, both right after the war and then in the mid 50s, and was so inspired by the worker priests who represented really how he saw Catholicism. I mean, it, it's an incredible period and we really respect it. Um, is that Bill McNichols behind you? Can I just say one last note? I'm, no, just gonna put on. In my, I'm just gonna put in my email address and if anybody wants the dissertation, I will just send you a PDF of it rather than wait for a book. But Sorry, Bill, but thank you, Eric. Bill, tell us about your, your artwork. Come on, get over here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I was trying to stay out. <laughs> so um, tell us about your work with Dan and Bill and your icons. Oh my gosh. Uh, first, I want to say that um, you made a, a beautiful movie. I saw the other, you know, the other version. And um, for this version, I was just like on the edge of my seat. You know, I was like, Oh my God, and the music, the music was really beautiful. I always, I always look for the music in every film. Um, they made a great film about Mexico, Bless Me Ultima. And uh, the music, the music in every film, especially in the mission that Dan was in and all that. But um, everybody talking, Jeremy was great as a narrator. I mean, I was really stunned by him. Frida, Jerry, Katie, I mean, everybody, um, it was such, such a moving movie. And I really, I really do think it is so important right now for people to see it because they don't have that, that history that, that um, all this began, you know, a long time ago, not even before Dan with, you know, somebody like Ben Salmon um, <clears throat> and before Phil, but, um, I love the family. I mean, I, I feel so honored to have known, um, the Berrigans, you know, the, especially, uh, I think especially Liz for me, you know, Liz has been important because she was an art historian and is a painter herself still and managed to be a great mother and a great wife and a great, just, just an extraordinary person and changed my life a lot. And recently I did a, something for her that she'd always wanted, which is a picture of uh, Rachel Carson. And she, she always pushed me. She says, you have to do a picture of Rachel Carson. So when I finally got to do it, I did. But your movie is just, magnificent and I hope everybody sees it and um, thank you all for participating and Eric I really really hope your book gets published in fact I'm going to do everything I can to <laughs> I can you know I'm nobody but I could I, anything I could do to make that happen I would do it um, and thank you again Sue and thank you uh, especially Rob for the music and especially uh, the Reality Brothers. Bye bye, everybody. I love and you. Bill is not a nobody. <laughs> yeah, Bill I'm a nobody. He is the, the icon <laughs> iconographer. And, um, you know, is the one, that, the person that inspired Dan to go ahead and do this work with AIDS patients that was nameless, that had no glory to it. He was able to be that person with you doing that work. Well, I wanna mention uh, Rosamond Solomon, whom you showed pictures. Uh, the mm -hmm. pictures you showed of people with AIDS were from Rosamond Solomon, Rosalind Solomon, who uh, lives in New York and is a, a really uh, extraordinary photographer. 
and she came to me in the 80s and said, I would like to photograph people with AIDS. And you showed many of her photographs, which, which were really very powerful. Um, but Dan, you know, Dan had already been working at St. Rose's Hospice. Mm -hmm. So he already had a leg in the, the other world, as we call it, you know, and then moved into the working with AIDS. And um, Sister Patrice Murphy really should be mentioned. Mm -hmm. Anybody, you know, would like to know, but she, she was the one that gave us all courage to be able to walk into AIDS, which was like the beginning of the pandemic that we have now without fear because she was a nurse and she, she kind of, you know, made us feel confident. But um, Dan was great and wrote that beautiful book um, about AIDS, you know, uh, Sorrow Built a Bridge. And that's a, that's a beautiful book about it. And I will never, ever forget um, being with Phil and being with Liz at Jonah House. And um, especially around the time of Phil's death, it was, it was really a profound experience that has never left me. And, and being with his children too, who are um, extraordinary people on their own as, as you saw in the film. So uh, good night, everybody. I love you. Bye. Thanks, Phil. No. Don't leave, Phil. I have to jump in right after you. Uh, um, we just have um, Rachel Carson up here. Uh, oh, Caitlin okay. pulled it off the wall. Uh, Bill McNichols, a uh, uh, beautiful uh, painting of Rachel Carson for Liz. Um, so. And so good to be with you, uh, Bill, on this 18th anniversary and to, to feel our, our lives all knitted together again um, over time and space. So um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, I needed to jump in on that also. The kids are coming in. Hi. We'll let them. This is Leah. Oh my God. This is Amos. Jonah's uh, not going to join us, I guess. We're really. Come on, let's when when uh, Bill heard that uh, Dad had terminal cancer, he hastened to paint this icon, uh, which then hung over Dad's bed. And I also see Barb Cass uh, on the screen. And Barb uh, stayed up many nights late uh, to make a beautiful flannel quilt uh, for Dad to die under. Mm. Um, and that's all very close uh, on, on this anniversary. Um, and I have to say, you know, I, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a, a shoes on the ground person, right? Um, and, and get up in the morning and, and set to the task. Uh, but the, my comments that, that you selected, Sue, were about dad's death and and they alluded to the movement of the spirit, uh, which moves in very mysterious ways. Uh, for example, um, I've had uh, visits from my father in dreams, mm -hmm. and they feel like real visits to me. Wow. Um, because he is, it, well, they, they tell me that he's free in the way that I spoke of him in, in the film. He's free to come and say hello and to mm -hmm. check in. Wow. And and twice now, these dreams have happened and I've woken up on the anniversary of his death, uh, including today. Mm. So I was hanging out with dad in my, in my last dream uh, this morning and, um, and I had to go do an errand. And the next thing you know, I find myself across town uh, in some shopping center trying to buy shoes for my daughter and I look outside and now it's rush hour and I'm not gonna get back in time. And then indeed I wake up, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I wake up thinking, you know, what's the takeaway, right? What are the priorities? What am I doing, you know? Um, and, and certainly uh, dad would appreciate someone examining one's life in that way, you know? He always encouraged all of us to do so. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the alignment of, of the date 
um, is, I, I can't see it as coincidental, even though I don't like, I don't know, I don't believe in magic or whatever, but I believe in the spirit, you know, I believe in the spirit. Thank you. You do believe in magic. <laughs> Maybe I do. <laughs> Jerry, you're Jerry Hildegard, remember? <laughs> I, I, I do. <laughs> What's more magical than somebody taking Hildegard for their confirmation name? <laughs> you should have seen the bishop. <laughs> you couldn't, couldn't believe it. <laughs> well, you created magic right there. You changed. I mean, I don't know anybody that's gotten away with that, but you. <laughs> yeah. By the time, yeah, by the time it was over, it was it was done. You know? <laughs> right. Thank you, Cherry. Thank you. Sir. Um, you know, what, when you talked about the spirit being right there, whew, you know, you totally felt it. You felt him. Um, and here we are, you know, so many years later. Uh, is there anything else that people would like to share now before we get off? Marianne? You got to go. I'd say get it into the films of, or into the schools, the Catholic schools, you know, it's a good place to start <laughs> as much as you might have difficulty with it. Oh yeah. my God. I like, you know, as Jim uh, inferred earlier, there was an earlier film called Seeking Shelter that had some funding from the Rhode Island Council for the Arts. And so, you know, you get this teeny grant, you can go to their, um, their you know, special, um, you know, cocktail parties. So I went to one of their cocktail parties as a funder, as a being, a, being Fun. funded. And uh, this woman came running up to me and said, I was taught by the Berrigan nuns uh, apparently around um, Albany. And she had been taught by the nuns um, who really believed in what we're talking about today and what the Berrigans, a century of Berrigans have been about. Um, yeah. So you, we, you're right, it needs to go. And my, my daughter, Jen is here somewhere. You hear Jen, there you are, just past you. And her daughters um, are watching it too, and they attend Catholic school. And and uh, Lillian came to a showing of Seeking Shelter that we did at what's the name of that school in Rhode Island, a Catholic college, and was quite oh. moved by the film. Uh oh, poor Jen. Regina. Yeah. What was Regina. It Regina. We yeah, yeah, Salve yeah. Regina. Salve, Salve Regina. Regina. There we go. Give it to the kids to take into the schools, to their, their social studies teachers, their religion teachers, like that, they, let them be the ones to get it into the school. It would be wonderful, really. Yeah. So, so just so that now that I'm unmuted, I just wanted to mention um, that it was so wonderful to be so close to Phil as he spoke, to see and feel his voice and his intonations and the same with Dan and Liz. But just, uh, I don't know, he was like an uncle for us. And like I said, we've known him since we were little, little. Actually, dad met, my, um, met Dan the night I was born. So that goes uh. way back, yeah. I'm old now. No, <laughs> that's a long time ago. It is. <laughs> Taylor, are you here? Taylor Sisk, you were I'm here. here. I am here. I've been lurking. You've been lurking, Taylor Sisk. You know, in kind of how, at least at one point, I thought we might market the film, is that this is 30 years. This is 30 years in the making, this film. Taylor, tell us. Well, about it's not, it. not quite 30, I don't think. Um, Ah, well, it's a good I'm, number. I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm primarily a journalist and not a filmmaker, although I've made a few films. But um, my, the first time I interviewed Dan was um, 
it must have been uh, maybe 1995 uh, when John, I don't think John, John Deere is, I don't know if he's still with us, but uh -huh. <clears throat> he and, and Phil were on trial in um, Elizabeth City, North Carolina for a Plowshares Act. And that's the first time I interviewed Dan, although um, Dan had been a big, big influence on my life. I was, uh, I was in the military and I filed a CO claim while on, a, on active duty and that's when I became introduced to, to Dan's writings. But um, I, so it's been about 25 years. But I, one thing I wanted to say, um, you, you, someone just mentioned that the close-ups, <clears throat> the, yeah, that's the, me. The that we, used, um, we, we shot, my partners and I shot the footage of Phil in um, prison in Petersburg. And I guess that was 1998. And um, it was his birthday. And I, I believe it must have been maybe his, uh, what would it have been? Maybe his 72nd, 73rd birthday. Mm -hmm. we, had, we, had brought, we had brought him some chocolate bars for his birthday. And we're so <laughs> close there on that close up, you can see a little bit of chocolate on his uh -huh. lip. And I had forgotten about that. I hadn't thought about that in many years. And it was, I don't know, it just touched me so deeply to, to see the chocolate on Phil's lips because he so much enjoyed those chocolate bars. And, and actually that day was, is one of the most memorable of my entire life. And uh, I just want to say, I think the film is wonderful. And it's been so wonderful to sit here with you guys and, and, and listen to this conversation. It's, it's an honor to be here. And Taylor, it's an honor to be with you. I don't think I've ever seen you before. I know no, I came to your I came to your uh, your place once in Brooklyn just for a couple of hours with my uh, partners at that time, and that's a whole story that we don't want to talk about with that partnership. But we met. It worked out. It oh, you're right. But this did work out. Um, uh, Kathy Boylan, actually, I think it was someone at the Catholic Worker in Washington that told us about Taylor, and then we sought Taylor out, and golly, that's been a long time, but. I'm well, so it's just, just so grat it's so, I'm so grateful to finally see some of this footage um, um, on the screen, and, and I hope, I just, it's, this has been such a long time coming. This documentary, and I'm, 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 I think uh, it's wonderful. I, I just hope, I hope uh, as many people as possible can see it. it, it as, as, as others have said, it couldn't be more timely today. Uh, Sue, can I just uh, interject and say, Chad Myers and Elaine, his wife, are wanting to make a comment. So if you could let them, Chad is, goes way back with uh, Phil and Sue and Dan sure. as a theologian and a community member. Chad, are you still there? Yes, yes, we are. Um, oh, hello, family. It has been so wonderful uh, to be with you this afternoon. I'm seeing a couple of your beaming faces at us. Um, it, you know, this afternoon uh, of being able to watch this film and then this conversation together just uh, reminds us uh, of how to how we need to be human um, in this time and. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you uh, for the hard work on this film. Um, we are so grateful. We are beaming in from uh, Southern California, Chumash territory and feel, feel connected over this big, big country. Uh, I'm just glad to be with you. Bill McNichols, here's what you can do for Eric's damn book. <laughs> you can provide the cover, bro. <laughs> Um, <laughs> nice to see you, Bill. <laughs> to see you. Um, while we're talking about um, Eric's book, I think it's only right that we also give a shout out mm -hmm. to Jim Forrest's wonderful yeah. biography yeah. on Dan, which has also, I think, been very uh, helpful in keeping this story alive. And I just want to share one thing since we we're having a little bit of a family moment there um, <clears throat> with uh Frida and Kate and Jill's family all on uh, all on the camera at the same time. You know, we we think a lot about the public witness of Liz and Dan and Phil, and and rightly so. But I think just about everybody here on this call uh, has had those moments in the seams mm -hmm. of that work, which were deeply personal, and deeply relational, and deeply transformative. Um, when I was 21, I hiked across the country from California 
and turned up on the doorstep of Jonah House at 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. on an October evening. Uh, here I was, uh, a non-Catholic, a non-Easterner, uh, didn't nobody know me. And the first uh, face at the door is Phil Berrigan. Wow. And, he opens, and he opens his arms and welcomes me like the prodigal son. And in that moment, mm. I began to heal from a very deeply personal father wound. Um, being part of a generation of the World War II, our fathers were the World War II generation. My dad, like Phil, had PTSD, didn't know how to show a lot of affection. And here I was suddenly welcomed into this crazy Irish Catholic clan that was completely embracing, uh, even though they didn't know me. And that familial sense has remained for 50 years. Uh, and I'm so deeply grateful for that part of the movement uh, that keeps us together. Yes, the public witness, yes, the politics of it, but it's the web of relationships and friendships, and I dare say family, uh, that is um, the backbone of the spirit that we're all feeling tonight. And I wanna thank not only the filmmakers and collaborators, but thank um, Liz, and uh, Jerry and family and uh, Kate and family and Frida and family for continuing to be family for all of us. We love you. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Sue, see what you've done. <laughs> oh Lord, yeah. Oh Thank great. You. I mean. No, oh, I feel the same way. Um, all lifted out of our quarantine by this movie, you know. Uh, let's not talk about that. <laughs> uh, so, family. Is there more family? Or should we have a family dinner? I wish somebody had the poem, some, and could read it right now. I don't. Um, Bill Wiley Kellerman would be able to recite that, I betcha. Bill? I, I can get it if you give me a minute. I <laughs> recite what? What a particular poem? Yeah, some. Uh, some. We thought we would end the film with some, uh, yeah. but we didn't, did we? Some yeah. good. Um, yeah. Oh, that's a great one. Some I stood know. up. We're, we're waiting, Bill. And then, unless someone has something more to say, we're trying we to really love you. We're trying to find it. So play some music. Can I do Psalm 126. I, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. This won't take long, and it's relatively painless. This is from Uncommon Prayer. I think it fits. Dan wrote, "When the Spirit struck us free, we could scarce believe it for very joy. Were we free? Were we wrapped?" in a dream of freedom, our mouths filled with laughter, our tongues with pure joy. The oppressors were awestruck. What marvels this spirit works for them. Like a flood in torrent, our people streamed out, locks, bars, cages, gulags, and ghettos, a nightmare scattered. We trod the long furrows, slaves, sowing in tears. A lightning bolt loosed us, and now we tread these same furrows, half drunk with joy, the golden sheaves in our arms. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, John. Just for those that don't know, that is John Bach. John Bach was um, uh, one, of the, one of the founders or beginning founders of Jonah House. He went around with Liz McAllister before Jonah House was Jonah House and uh, met Phil and Dan in Danbury Prison prior to meeting Phil and Dan as a, as a CO. John is a very important person uh, in the movement uh, and a great friend as well. Thank you, John. And thank you, all of you. Um, love to you all. We are going to bring this film out where we are together in this, we may ask you to help us lead a group to discuss it. 
Um, and uh, we are so thankful. We, this film is because of you all. So love to you all and hugs to you all and stay safe. Good night, all. Good night. Blessings. Good night. Good night. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Good night. Good night, Good night John Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, Jim Reali. <laughs> Goodbye, Mary. <laughs> Good night, Sue. So loved it. Good night. Love you. <laughs> this was wonderful. <laughs> oh my god good to meet you sue thank you all thank you jim thank you susan it's fabulous be safe and uh happy holidays to all mm. yeah john shushard where's john shushard is that john shushard right here Yes, so this is my first time on Zoom. Can you hear me? We yeah, can. we can hear you. Just, just to announce, John Shushard was one of the original Plowshares 8 for people that do not know. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thanks to everyone. My love and gratitude to each and every one of you with my whole heart and my whole soul. Uh, thank you. John, you're wearing that hat kind of like how Phil did. <laughs> well, I've always worn I, a hat like this since law school. You can you can crush it and put it in your hat, in your pocket anywhere. Yeah. Uh, it's cold up here in Massachusetts. I tend to wear it all the time now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my Will and Tam. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. All right. Well. So great to be with everybody. All right. Good night, all. Good night, Good night. all. Bye.